Welcome. You are listening to the preaching of God's Word at the United Baptist Church of Ellsworth, Maine. Thank you for listening, and we hope you hear what the Lord has for you today. In what or whom do you place your confidence? A quick search on the internet of the word confidence is guaranteed to fill your screen with countless inspirational quotes and anecdotes testifying to or designed to bolster your faith in you. A consistent message of this world is you can do it. Believe in yourself or perhaps most recently You got this. Which seems appropriate if you're trying to encourage a child to hit a ball. Or you're teaching a kid not to fear the water. Or getting a teenager to pass a driving test. Attempting to alleviate a student's anxiety over going to college. Or motivating a person to face their fears of public speaking. There is a time and a place for individuals to look within and to believe in themselves, but in other times, this insistence on our attempt to build self-confidence in a situation falls flat. You can't say you got this to the spouse who doesn't want a divorce while the other is insistent on its happening. You can't say you got this to the parent whose child is drug addicted, to the person with the disease that will not be held at bay with diet and exercise. It would be cruel to say such a thing to the family experiencing tragedy like what I, and I suspect you just read about this week, a pastor's family that lost a six-year-old to a freak accident while they were on sabbatical in Maine. You can't say you got this to the Christian in Yemen who will be killed if she's caught sharing the gospel. No. In those times, one is painfully aware that no amount of self-confidence is going to do anything. We need another type. A belief in something greater than anything we mere mortals can scab together. In moments like these, we need a savior. We need a defender. We need a deliverer. We need confidence in God. Our Father, as we come before your word this morning, we do so humbly, desirous to receive all that you have for us. We are so thankful to you, God, that you have the words of life, that your words provide for us the true meaning of this existence that you've blessed us with. Would you be with us this morning in the power of your spirit that we might hear your voice, for yours is the voice that matters most and always. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. So although it starts in a figurative minor key, Psalm 129 is actually a psalm of communal confidence. The worship leader begins with a backward glance over Israel's history and he concludes this, Greatly have they afflicted me from my youth. He speaks in the singular me and my, but it is clear from the context that he's speaking for a nation. He's speaking for the nation of Israel. The Old Testament speaks of Israel as an individual. For instance, Hosea chapter 11, verse 1 is an example of this. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. So this psalm is not the testimony of an individual per se, but of a community. From its birth, Israel has experienced hardship. That word translated afflicted, it means to cramp, it means to press in. And the, the, the Hebrew people were often pressed, pressed into brick making in Egypt, pressed into captivity in Babylon. Many times, the King James translation says, Spurgeon would say, too many to count. The people of God were threatened, they were opposed, they were oppressed, they were invaded, and they were mistreated. And this is their story, a story of frequent suffering. 
Scholar Derek Kidner notes, he says, Whereas most nations tend to look back on what they have achieved, Israel reflects here on what she has survived. It could be a disheartening exercise, for Zion still has its ill wishers. But the singers take courage from the past, facing God with gratitude and their enemies with defiance. After his initial declaration, the psalmist beckons the choir of fellow travelers to join him. This is the same as what we saw in uh, Psalm 124, almost a call and response. Let Israel now say. So, so the worship leader says, greatly have they afflicted me from my youth. And then let Israel now say, which is just a nice way of saying, all together now. And they repeat the exact same thing. Greatly have they afflicted me from my youth. It's interesting to consider that while you and I may do all we can to forget aspects of our painful past, God directs His children to sing about them. That's what psalms are, you know. Psalms are songs. And the Psalter is Israel's hymn book. And here on the way to worship, the people are singing about hard times. About the hard times they might prefer to forget. But they are not glorying in the struggle as even some contemporary worship songs do, they're celebrating their deliverance. Yes, yes, the afflictions have been many. We will concur in song. Yet they have not prevailed against me. Try as they might, our enemies have not been able to overcome us. We've been down, but never out. And we're still standing. This reminds me of the Apostle Paul's testimony that you find in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. For its whole existence, the pressure on Israel has been steady and significant, but it has not led to their demise. The people of God press on. They are not, despite the wishes of their enemies, wiped out. They are not defeated. Their foes may rise against them, but they have not prevailed. They will not prevail. And the message of the psalm is clear. God preserves his people. God preserves His people. This is His covenant faithfulness. This is His commitment to us. Just as we saw in the New Testament church a while ago when we did the, our study through the book of Acts, the true Israel of God is unstoppable. The enemy does not win. They, or He, will never ever have the final word. Do you get that, church? The enemy will never win. Have the final word. And the passage before us this morning breaks down neatly into two sections. First, we see praise for divine deliverance, which is followed by a prayer for divine judgment. So praise for divine deliverance. In verse 3, the writer gives a very graphic picture of Israel's affliction. You have to picture the scene, a rustic plow yoked to a large animal, dragging a metal edge through the dirt to make rows for planting. I literally witnessed this, this in April in our uh, hit-and-run visit to Amish country in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. Old-school plows harnessed to great big horses, tilling up the Keystone State dirt. Now substitute that field for flesh. The flesh of Israel's back. Israel stretched out, prone. Its enemy plowing on its back. Figuratively digging into it with a coarse blade. And dragging that up and down and up and down. Bloody, long rows. That's what we're meant to envision. The sort of markings one would expect, say, from the lashing of a whip. In fact, this could well be a a poetic depiction of the sort of abuse that Israel suffered in slavery in Egypt. It is an agonizing and an emotionally latent 
depiction of the brutal oppression of a people, of what it often felt like to identify with God in the midst of those who hate him and all he stands for. The plowers plowed upon my back. They made long their furrows. It wasn't a short visit. They made long their furrows. But, verse 4, the Lord is righteous. In the center of this psalm, is this central message. More than a declaration of the obvious, okay? We would be thinking, well, of course God is righteous. But this statement points us to why believers are able to hold up under great pressure. And we might rightly wonder about that. How does a child of God endure consistent suffering? The Lord knows there are enough Job's wives out there, people around to urge us to escape our unpleasant or seemingly unfortunate circumstances, people who are angry about what's happening to us and then tell us, like Job's wife, why don't you just curse God and die? <laughs> Let's just get this over with. Walk away from this God. He can't be a very good God. To let this happen to you. There are enough well-meaning but theologically bereft counselors who, like Job's friends, are miserable comforters and give very poor counsel that just isn't helpful in times of suffering. How does one maintain faith and resilience in hardship and the sort of systemic oppression that Israel often faced. The psalmist inserts the key for us right here in verse 4. The Lord is righteous. One perseveres by maintaining faith that God is good. By knowing that whatever comes one's way, God is in it. And it comes through Him. By believing the Lord knows best. By trusting, he understands how much one can bear and how long and why one ought to be bearing it in the first place. One perseveres by having confidence that the Lord is able and will deliver his dear ones as he sees fit in his perfect time and in his perfect way. And most importantly, one perseveres because the Lord himself sees to it. He has covenanted with us. He has covenanted with his people. He will not let them go. One commentator explains and says, Righteous is out and out a term denoting a relationship. And it does this in the sense of referring to a real relationship between two parties not to the relationship of an object under consideration to an idea. That God is righteous means that God is in relationship with His people. And God preserves His people. In the words of the late pastor, author, theologian, Eugene Peterson, the central reality for Christians is the personal, unalterable, persevering commitment God makes to us. Perseverance is not the result of our determination. It is the result of God's faithfulness. We survive in the way of faith, not because we have extraordinary stamina, but because God is righteous, because God sticks with us. Christian discipleship is a process of paying more and more attention to God's righteousness and less and less attention to our own. Finding the meaning of our lives not by probing our moods and motives and morals, but by believing in God's will and purposes. Making a map of the faithfulness of God, not charting the rise and fall of our enthusiasms. It is out of such a reality that we acquire perseverance. In charting the map of God's faithfulness, the singers in Psalm 129 declare triumphantly of him, he has cut the cords of the wicked. Which means he comes through. The Lord delivers. That it is the Lord who has, understand this, it is the Lord who has final say over the antics of our enemies. It is the Lord who says this far and no farther. It is the Lord who says definitively and in his perfect time, enough. 
So picture that same scene from verse 3, the rustic plow hitched to this large animal dragging along one's back, and then picture what it would be like if the cords linking the animal to the blade were severed, were cut. The whole operation is now rendered useless. No more plowing, no more tearing anything up. Whether it be field or flesh, the Lord neutralizes the pain-inflicting means of the enemy. Stops him in his tracks. Now commentators seem to agree here. The word translated cords actually means more than the leather straps connecting equipment to farm animals. or, or uh, It stands for the whole system of yoking. And the yoke, of course, is not just a farming implement connecting animals together for work or animals to equipment, it is an image in the Bible. The Bible uses this image to, de to depict oppression and, and captivity, slavery. Leviticus chapter 26, verse 13, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt that you should not be their slaves. I have broken the bands of your yoke and I have made you walk upright. The oppressed and bent over God has broken the yoke that they can walk upright. Or then there's the counsel given to King Rehoboam, which, by the way, he didn't heed. That's another story. 1 Kings verse 12, uh, chapter 12, verse 4. Your father made our yoke heavy. Now, therefore, lighten the burdensome service of your father and his heavy yoke under which he put on us, and we will serve you. The yoke is unwanted captivity. It is a heavy burden. And then Jeremiah. The prophet Jeremiah spoke of Israel being free from this sort of thing. Chapter 30, verse 8. And it shall come to pass in that day, declares the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off your neck, and I will burst your bonds, and foreigners shall no more make a servant of him. To cut the yoke, to cut the cords is to cut the yoke away. And so this psalm, which acknowledges all of Israel's struggles, at the same time celebrates the liberating mercy of God. The breaking of the yoke, the cutting of the cords. Yes, the afflictions have been massive and they have been frequent, but there is no hint of self-pity here. There is no hint of desperation in the psalmist's words. Instead, we find a quiet, understated, faithful confidence reminiscent of Paul's encouraging words to Timothy. Paul, when he gave these words, the Apostle Paul was a political prisoner. The prognosis for his survival is absolutely grim, and yet there isn't one shred of panic in his voice. And he tells his beloved friend, what does he tell him? He says, I know whom I have believed. I can be this way because I know whom I have believed. Notice Paul doesn't say, I know what I have believed. We put a lot of emphasis on what we believe. And it is important to have our doctrine right and our theology squared away. It's important to know what we believe. More so, it is important to know who we believe. And R.C. Sproul put it this way, there's a difference between believing in God and believing God. There's a difference between believing in God, even the devil and the demons believe that. So that's no great thing. If you say, well, I believe in God, that's not, that's not much of a trick. Believing in God is common. Believing God, that is the key. And that is rare. That is rare. The psalmist believes God. And he believes that God is greater than the plowman plowing up and down his back. God is greater than the people and the things that cause us pain. God has disabled the weapons of evil. He has freed his people from them. He has cut the cords of the wicked. And living as we do, and when we do, we know that he has done this in no greater way than through his son Jesus. The parallels between Israel and Jesus are not coincidental. Earlier I quoted Hosea 11.1, 1, out of Egypt I have called my son. And that was in reference to Israel, Israel coming out of Egypt. Though in Matthew's gospel, we find it is fulfilled in Jesus. And Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 and 15 captures the affliction of Jesus by the way that started in his youth. It says this, now when they, they being the wise men that uh, were sent from Herod, and why did Herod send wise men to find the baby Jesus? Do you remember? So he could know where he was so he could go and kill him. That's how Jesus started, right? Great have been my afflictions from my youth up. That's how Jesus started. Now when they, these wise men, had departed, 
and they tricked him, and they went in a different way, which is a cool part of the story. But again, another story. <laughs> An angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet out of Egypt. I called my son. Jesus, we will learn, is the new Israel. The faithful Israel. That would be all that God intended for his Israel to be. Jesus would succeed where Israel failed. He came out of Egypt. He passed through the waters. He was tested in the wilderness. Does this sound familiar? At every turn, though, Jesus did what was right, and he did what was pleasing to his father. He would be greatly afflicted. The image of the furrows on the back of Israel casts us forward to the furrows on the back of Christ. They were put there by the cruel whip of his enemies who thought they held him in captivity. It is a startling and a true recurring theme of Scripture that at times even the enemies of God are the instruments fulfill for fulfilling the will of God. It was in fact the Father's will that his son Jesus should be arrested and that he should suffer, not for sins that he had done, but for our sins. 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. He, Jesus, is the propitiation for our sins, the atonement for our sins. He paid the price for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Why does he do this? Why does Jesus come? Jesus atones for sins because the Lord is righteous. Because he's committed to his people. Because he loves us. Because he loves you. So at the expense of his own son, he made a way for us to be saved. On the cross and with his life, Jesus paid the price for our wrongdoing. And so Isaiah rightly predicted, it was for our transgressions that he was pierced. It was for our iniquities that Jesus was crushed. It was for us that the Son of God bore the chastisement of God so we could know peace with God. It is by the stripes of the suffering servant of God, that we are healed. It is by his atoning sacrifice, his death, his resurrection from the dead, that for those who will put their faith in him, he cut the cords of the wicked. He frees us from the yoke of sin and invites us to adorn ourselves with another. You see, and you should know that the freedom God offers in Christ is not a liberation from every yoke. It is freedom from the yoke of sin and all that sin brings. He cuts those cords. He does away with that. That yoke is destroyed, but only so a better yoke can be put in its place. Liberation from the throes of sin is not just for us to be able to go and do whatever we want, which is sometimes how we think of that. I profess Jesus as my Savior, I get my fire insurance, and now I can do whatever I want. That's not what the gospel teaches. That's not what the Bible teaches. God mercifully cuts us loose from bondage so we can actually and finally be free to do what we were created for, which is to serve Him with our lives. That's why we're here, to make much of God. Here you find another echo of the Exodus experience. God's word to Pharaoh was what? Do you remember it? Let my people go. Why? That they may serve me. We are saved to serve. God saves us to serve. And what that means is he takes the yoke of sin away from us. He cuts those cords in order to give us, or in order that we might come under a different yoke. That's what Jesus is talking about in Matthew's gospel. And in the 11th chapter, the invitation that he gives for those who are weak and ready to come to him. An invitation to those who are worn out trying to do everything on their own. Who are exhausted trying to do the right things and frustrated because they can't. Who are tired of what seems like a futile existence, making no headway whatsoever. Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. <laughs> Jesus says, try me. <laughs> That's what he's saying. You've tried all this other junk. Try me. 
Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Why? Because I'm gentle and lowly in heart. Not like those awful taskmasters. Not like sin. And he says, you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. In contrast to the cords of the wicked. And in the vein of Christ's words here about his yoke are the words of God given in Hosea chapter 11 verse 4. He says, I led them. This is Israel. God speaking of Israel. I led them with the cords of kindness, with the bands of love. And I came to them as one who eases the yoke on their jaws. And I bent down to them. And I fed them. That is Jesus. That is God come to this world. The bread of life. Coming from heaven, bending down, condescending to us that we might be fed. Friend, are you tethered today by the cords of wickedness or the cords of kindness? By the cords of love? Or are you tethered to the enemy of your soul by the cords of evil? Sin is a taskmaster, you know. It's going to drive you to death. But Jesus is a co-laborer who will make your journey through this life meaningful and who shares the burdens with you. That's the only way they could be considered light because being a Christian is not inoculation from trouble and struggle and strife. It's having someone carry the burdens with you. That's what makes them light. Not easy, but light. If you want to prevail over your enemies, including that last great enemy, death, which is coming for all, you must be freed from sin and joined with God in Christ, who has overcome sin and the grave. Praise God, he has indeed cut the cords of the wicked. And he's done it in a glorious way that the psalmist can only hint at. We move now to the praise from uh, this praise of divine deliverance to a prayer for divine judgment. Verses 5 through 8. May all who hate Zion be put to shame and turned backward. Let them be like the grass on the housetops, which withers before it grows up, with which the reaper does not fill his hand, nor the binder of sheaves his arms, nor do those who pass by say the blessing of the Lord be upon you. We bless you in the name of the Lord. I don't know how you felt when Donna read those verses. If you were tracking along, you might, have, you might have sat back in your chair a little bit and said, well, that doesn't seem too nice. <laughs> May all who hate Zion be put to shame and turned backward. Let them be like grass on the housetops that withers before it grows. Our Western ears and sensibilities are not accustomed to this kind of clear, direct language about others. We're not, we're not accustomed to the pronouncement of curses although it seems to be coming into fashion uh, a bit more these days. But in terms of church talk, let's just say in terms of church talk, in, in terms of all you nice Christians, um, we would probably hang back a little bit from being so forward with our thoughts here or our hopes for those who are causing us trouble. But before we allow ourselves to be entirely put off by these words, we should give them a good look. They do not fall into that pray for your enemies and those who spitefully use you category that we New Testament believers have heard. They are not dripping with the Romans 12 call for us not to be overcome by evil, but to overcome evil with good. And yet at the same time, they are not. If you would examine them, they are not as mean as they might for a sound. James Montgomery Boyce has written this. It's striking in this case, at least, how mild these imprecations are. The psalmist is not asking that those who have harmed Israel be sent to hell, or even that they experience the same suffering that they've inflicted on others. He asks only that they and their designs might not prosper. And Spurgeon jumps on this idea. He says of this prayer that it's a proper wish and contains within it no trace of personal ill will. We desire their welfare as men, their downfall as traitors. Let their conspiracies be confounded. Let their policies be turned back. How can we wish prosperity to those who would destroy that which is dearest to our hearts? 
So when the Lord calls us to pray for our enemies, and he does tell us to pray for our enemies, and we should pray for our enemies, he does not instruct us to pray for their success in the endeavors that are contrary to the kingdom of God. He would rather that we care enough about them as people made in his image to pray for their enlightenment, to pray for their restoration, to pray for their salvation, to pray for their turning away from sin, that they might come under kingly rule. So here the psalmist prays quite mildly when you really think about it in the grand scheme for the work of God's enemies to be fruitless. Perhaps the hope is that if what they're doing isn't working, they'll stop doing it. Verse 5, may all who ate Zion, Zion, the place, uh, the mount on which Jerusalem is built, symbolic of the place and the people of God, may all who hate the place and the people of God be put to shame and turn back. The image, image here is of a retreating army, an, an army that's advancing against the people of God, but that it is being repelled. And in being repelled, it has to retreat. And it retreats in shame. And the reason that it retreats in shame is because its actions are shameful. And you know what? It is shameful to war against God. It is shameful. I know we're losing a sense of shame in our society. We don't want anyone to feel ashamed about anything. But when there's right and wrong, there's going to be shame and joy. And it is shameful to war against God and against God's people. God deserves the allegiance of his creation, not its rebellion. And again, we better find this language to be harsh. But it is a reflection of the same language that the prophet Isaiah used to describe idolaters. Isaiah 42, verse 17, they are turned back and utterly put to shame who trust in carved idols, who say to metal images, you are our gods. We should hope that those who rise against God would be turned back. We should hope that those who would rise against God would suffer humiliating defeat. Let them be put to flight in battle. Perhaps the failure of their offensive against the Most High would lead them to the true pleasure and abundant life that is found by walking with God, not fighting against Him. Let them be like grass on the housetops, which withers before it grows up. Any of you pray like this? Let them be finished before they get started, is what he's saying. Let them be done before they get going. The flat roofs in that region, right, collected lots of dirt. Many of them were sawed roofs just to begin with. So seeds in the dirt or sprigs from the sod would occasionally sprout. But because there was no depth of soil and because of exposure to the heat of the sun, any grass that sprung up would quickly wither and die. It was good for nothing, that grass. It would be of no benefit to anyone. And that's the prayer. Let the efforts of those who rise against God amount to nothing. May they be useless in their cause. Let the short-lived nature of their endeavors be, be obvious. Let the inevitable end of their promise be realized quickly. Let them be of no benefit to anyone. And third, let them not receive the Lord's blessing. Or let them remain unblessed. In the book of Ruth, we have a picture of a fruitful harvest where the landowner Boaz comes down from Bethlehem, and while walking through his field, he says to the reapers, the Lord be with you. We might envision these reapers with their arms full of sheaves, the Lord be with you, and they answer, the Lord bless you. If you have a chance to join us sometime on a short-term mission trip to the Dominican Republic, you will be greeted, I'm sure, not with just the casual, hola, I think that means hi, but often with a sweeter sound. God bless you. You'll be greeted that way. We say that when people sneeze. I don't even know why. They say it as a greeting, a blessing. We cannot bless or hope those to be blessed whose efforts are contrary to the kingdom, church. That's what the psalmist is saying. That's all he's saying with this curse. One cannot wish well in the name of Jesus. The very odds, the very work that is at odds with Jesus. Rather, one might wish for the fast failure of the enemies of God. So such people would be inspired to repent. And they would work with God, not against him. Otherwise, as we heard recently in Psalm 127, their lives will be spent in vain. 
If they don't learn to work with God and they continue to work against Him, their lives will be spent in vain. So I want you to consider, friends, the opposition to the godless in prayer that we find in these three imprecations that conclude Psalm 129 may not be the mean and judgmental words that our culture has trained our ears to hear. We're not supposed to speak this clearly. We're not supposed to be this direct. We're supposed to look at things that we find stupid and offensive and say, Oh, God bless you. May the blessing of the Lord not. Right? That's disingenuous. That's not true. These words are true. And if answered, they might just be the impetus for the enemies of God to become friends. And remember, verse 4, the Lord is righteous. He will deal justly with those who love him. And he will deal justly with those who don't. He does what is right by his people. And he does what is right by those who harm his people. Albert Barnes, in his notes on the Bible, writes this, God is righteous in permitting this, that is in reference to the many afflictions of Israel. He's righteous in what he has done. He's righteous in what he will do. And the treatment of those who inflict such wrongs. We may now safely commit our cause to him in view of what he has done in the past. He was not indifferent then to our sufferings or deaf to the cries of his people. He interposed and punished the oppressors of his people, and we may trust him still. If there is a bottom line to this psalm, that last line would be it. We may trust him still. Amen. When, like Israel of old, we reflect on how wonderfully we, personally and as a people of God, have been preserved. Let that then fortify our hope for the future that is in store for us. He has cut the cords of the wicked. Therefore, we may expect some occasional reprieve from evil in the here and now, while we are confident of its riddance in eternity. However great our afflictions may be, we are reminded by God's word that they are in truth light and momentary. And they are preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. A glory that no eye has seen, nor ear has heard, nor heart has imagined. The glory of what God and Christ has prepared for those who love him. Our Father, as we come away from this psalm, we are moved in one of two directions. We are elated to be counted among those for whom the cords of wickedness have been cut, or we are reminded that we are still yoked to sin and subject to its consequences. We want to praise you and thank you, God, for your power over evil, for your readiness to forgive our sins, to cut the, coat, the cords of wickedness, to give us a yoke of kindness. We hear your invitation to come to you, Father, and that's what we're doing today in our hearts as we ponder this psalm, coming to you again and again. You're the one who can make our burdens light. You're the one who assures us our enemies will not prevail. You're the one who gives us the victory. God, we thank you for loving your people the way that you love them. We thank you that you are righteous when we are not. We rest in it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks for listening. If you have questions about what you heard in today's sermon, please contact us via email at ubc at ubcellsworth.org or through Facebook Messenger at facebook.com slash UBC Ellsworth. Better yet, if you're able, join us in person at the corner of Hancock and Pine Streets in Ellsworth, Maine. We'd love to meet you. Our worship service begins at 1030 on Sunday morning. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you.